Welcome to Lesson 1 in a three-part series on Lean Material Flow. I'm Richard Ron. This is the first lesson titled, Three Massive Mistakes in Lean Material Flow. For your time management purposes, this presentation will last about 10 minutes. So, why use the word massive? Isn't that a little over the top? Well, maybe, but if you make these mistakes, it's virtually guaranteed that you won't be happy with the performance of your material delivery system. So this is worth paying attention to. So let's start with an introduction to our subject and the boundaries of this discussion. Lean manufacturing design is like a bird with two wings. I've never seen a four-winged bird, uh, come to think of it, but one wing is what we call process design, which is focused on things like standard work, tack time, resource calculations, line balancing, and physical line layout. The other wing is focused on the delivery of materials needed to support this line and on the storage and presentation of this material. Included here are setting optimum quantities for each item, container sizes, delivery route design, and material storage. And we call this material flow. We'll concentrate on this aspect of lean design, that is material flow, in this presentation. So let's jump right in and look at the first massive mistake, poor delivery route design. So what do we mean by delivery route? Well, think of a mail delivery route. The postman or postwoman follows a standard route from mailbox to mailbox. The delivery frequency is daily except for holidays and Sundays. So the route needs to be completed in a day. In a factory, material delivery should work much the same way. A standard route is defined, and depending on the size of your factory, you could have many routes, and material is replenished to the various points of use in a routine and consistent way, based on a designed cycle of replenishment. That's the replenishment time. So. Here are some of the benefits of delivering materials in this way. One, you can make the material delivery an extension of the line itself, running at a predictable and fixed rate. We sometimes call that tack time. So your material delivery route would have a rhythm or beat that it's running to, which would be the cycle time. Two, you can staff your material delivery system correctly using standard times. Benefit three, and maybe the most important, you can shorten or shortage-proof your line by setting your cycle of replenishment time to be significantly less than your inventory quantity time. So let's analyze what I mean by that. Picture a simple two-bin Kanban system with one day of material based on average usage in each bin. Each bin has one day. When a bin is empty, a signal is sent to material delivery to bring another one. In the meantime, the operator has a second bin that will last, on average, one day. So that's the standard two-bin Kanban methodology. Now, our concern with a Kanban system like this is, what happens if we consume material faster than planned? Will we potentially run out? And the answer is yes. If, however, our cycle of replenishment is set to be less than one day, we can overcome variability in usage. So let's do the math. If our cycle of replenishment is two times per day, and remember we had one day worth of material, then we can theoretically handle usage that is double the originally planned usage of one day. Another example, if our cycle of replenishment is four times per day, then the material delivery system can respond to an increase in usage that is four times the originally planned usage rate. Assuming that the material is available for delivery, either from a supermarket, a warehouse, or even an outside supplier, setting the cycle of replenishment correctly can virtually shortage-proof your line. So what is the actual massive mistake number one? Well, it's a failure to design formal delivery routes with a frequent cycle of replenishment time. There's a lot more we could say about delivery route design, but let's move on to the next massive mistake, over-reliance on Kanban. So I'm assuming here that your organization has embraced lean principles and material Kanban 
is certainly one of these principles. Now, in the early days of lean, at least in the United States, the recommendation was to convert as many items as possible to the Kanban method, especially C or inexpensive items. And that worked okay, more or less. In recent years, however, there's been a sea change or a shift in the use of Kanban, even within companies like Toyota, the developers of the original Kanban system. There are some weaknesses in the Kanban method, and let's list them. First, Kanban bins at the point of use take a lot of physical space. In the extreme case, you'd need room for every part used on every model. Second, operators may need to move more if the parts are not directly in front of them, and this is waste. Third, having operators select parts introduces the possibility of error, especially if the items are similar to other ones. Fourth, the selection of parts takes time. And fifth, the inventory investment is higher in a Kanban system since you're creating a permanent storage for items that you may not need all the time. Now, in case this sounds a bit too negative, let me say, we still recommend the Kanban method. Toyota still uses it, and it remains a valuable tool in the Lean Toolkit. But the sea change is this. Lean companies, including Toyota, are shifting towards a high percentage or a higher percentage of parts delivered via what we call sequence delivery or even kitting. Now, kitting used to have a bad reputation in lean circles, based on the perception, not entirely untrue, that it added a lot of non-value-adding effort. And it is certainly true that kitting takes time. However, if that kitting time can be more than offset by higher operator productivity, reduced line side space, and improved quality, then it makes good sense. So what is the massive mistake here? Use a back of a napkin analysis approach, meaning informal, don't spend too much time on it, but you can roughly estimate the following savings. Floor space savings with a cost per square foot. That's mostly line side material space savings. An estimated productivity gain for operators. That would be a percentage productivity gain times the number of operator labor hours per year in that area. And third, the potential inventory savings. When you add it all up, that sum is virtually guaranteed to be a big number, even if you're very conservative in your estimates. If you don't take advantage of this opportunity, you're figuratively flushing dollars down the toilet every day. As always, there's a lot more we could say here, but let's move on to the third massive mistake number three, not having a plan for every part. A plan for every part is a repository of data for every single item that you need to manage, for your line and for the entire plant. So think of it as a database that captures every data element you might want to know about a part, both manufactured and purchased. You probably already have a similar kind of database called your MRP or ERP system. And common ERP systems include SAP and Oracle, but there are many others. The problem with systems of this type is that they are really good at capturing information, but they're not so good at putting that information into a format that is flexible and user-friendly and easy to use. For that reason, a plan for every part database is usually, in our experience, a download from a main system into a large spreadsheet. In the spreadsheet format, you can slice, dice, filter, and sort the data and add new data elements as well, new columns in the spreadsheet. So why is a plan for every part, or sometimes abbreviated PFEP, important? This will be your primary planning tool for your lean material delivery system. Included here will be your plan for containerization, for inventory quantities, for delivery strategies, and on and on. And all of this information is in one place, rather than scattered around a variety of different ERP modules. If you don't have and use a PFEP tool, it will be much more difficult to create an integrated material delivery system, since the information that you will need won't be readily available. We will be presenting more information on a plan for every part in an upcoming lesson in this series. 
So consider this just an appetizer on this subject. In the next lesson, the upcoming lesson, we will be coming back to the technical details of designing a delivery route. And in the third and the final lesson in this series, we'll come back to the plan for every part topic and show you how you would set one up for yourself. So thanks for your attention. We'll be releasing the next lesson shortly, so stay tuned. And how did we do on time? I think pretty well. So we'll see you at the next lesson.